and I'm delighted to be here to talk about some of the research that's been ongoing in my labs at Imperial. So I run a highly collaborative research group in the Department of Chemistry here at Imperial, and ultimately we aim to develop chemistry-led approaches to validate novel disease targets and hopefully translate these targets further. And of course, given the launch event today, I'll be focusing on my lab's work in new therapeutics for human malaria, and particularly highlighting a long-standing collaboration my group has had with Professor Arthur Scherf's group at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And together, Arthur and I have been aiming to validate a novel enzyme class, the histone lysine methyltransferases, that are intrinsically involved in so-called epigenetic gene regulation. Now, since we have a broad audience here, I thought I'd give a very, very brief introduction to epigenetics. I think it's now very well understood that the complexity in your coding DNA does not represent the complexity that one sees in cellular, cellular systems and in life. And epigenetics is one centrally important mechanism that helps determine how, where, and when different genes are switched on and switched off. And ultimately, those different dynamic programs, I think we're going to hear from transcriptional control in the next talk, underpin some of that biological complexity. And this is an often given example that's very illustrative in this area. This is the transformation of a caterpillar to a moth. Exactly the same DNA sequence underpins this transformation, but clearly we get a very different outward appearance, of, and that is underpinned by a very different epigenome, very different sets of genes being switched on and switched off at various stages that underpin these outward appearances. And indeed, epigenetics has become a very important area of research. It's incredibly important in cellular differentiation and cellular identity, but it's becoming increasingly apparent that it's very important in the onset and maintenance of human disease. And so there's many programs worldwide aiming to target these processes in human disease, perhaps the most advanced being cancer. But ultimately, today, I'm going to be focusing on our efforts to validate some of these pathways in the plasmodium parasite. Now, in order to understand how epigenetic processes operate, we need to look in a little more detail about how your DNA is packaged in the nucleus of uh, a eukaryotic cell. So here we see, here's our DNA double strand, our double helical strand of DNA, and here you can see it's wrapped around an octameric complex of proteins known as histones. And this forms a fundamental repeating unit of chromatin called the nucleosome. And as you can see in this cartoon, these nucleosomes with your DNA wrapped around your octameric histone core pack down into higher order chromatin structures and arrays. And it's actually thought that the transcriptional status of genes is very dependent on that structural organization of the chromatin. So for example, genes contained in regions where the chromatin is highly compact and condensed are effectively silenced, they are switched off whereas genes contained in more loose, open forms of chromatin are actively transcribed and switched on. So this idea of closed and open chromatin leading to genes being switched off or switched on. Now, in turn, that structural status is regulated by a number of post-translational modifications on the histones themselves, particularly at the N-terminal tail. And I'm going to be focusing on one of those modifications today, histone lysine methylation. So this is an event that occurs on specific lysine amino acid residues on those histone proteins. It's an event that's installed by the histone lysine methyltransferase enzymes that use this s methionine cofactor. And multiple methylation groups can be installed onto these lysines that all have regulatory consequences on the structure of chromatin and in turn the transcriptional status of different genes. Now, importantly, the histone lysine methyltransferases in humans have become very important drug targets, and there's at least two inhibitors in clinical trials against certain genetically defined cancers. But for the purpose of this talk, it's worth pointing out that the histone lysine methyltransferases and histone methylation in general is very nicely conserved in the plasmodium parasite. The parasite heavily relies on epigenetic processes to regulate transcription, and if we focus on some key histone methylation marks, comparing them to the epigenetic code in humans, to Plasmodium falciparum, these marks are very nicely conserved 
And this suggests that actually some of the interest in these processes in human biology should translate also to plasmodium biology. Now, there are actually 10 predicted histone lysine methyltransferase enzymes in the parasite genome that have been studied to varying extent. But importantly, they've all been attempted to be disrupted genetically, and at least six of them seem to be refractory to disruption in the blood stage, which suggests they may be essential enzymes and then, in theory, may be important and interesting drug targets. And so Artur and I have been trying to further prosecute this area, learn more about the histone lysine methyltransferases in plasmodium, and ultimately develop chemical tools and inhibitors to progress to inhibit these and study their effects as a therapeutic. Now, given the technical uh, tools available to us when we started this, one of the primary approaches we've been taking so far is to effectively repurpose inhibitors of similar enzymes from other species, particularly humans. As I mentioned, there's been a large amount of activity developing inhibitors for the human enzymes, so we've been studying those inhibitor classes and seeing how they map on to effects in the plasmodium parasite. And we've looked at a number of different types of inhibitor classes. For example, we've studied inhibitors that come from natural sources, natural products, but we've also been studying synthetic compounds that come from effectively pharmaceutical libraries. And it's one of these classes that I'm going to be talking about today, this diaminoquinazoline called BIX1294, that originally came out of a high throughput screen by the company Boehringer that was identified to be inhibitor of a human histone lysine methyltransferase. And it's since been shown that actually this scaffold can engage a number of the human histone lysine methyltransferases, which suggests it to be a useful chemotype to engage this enzyme class. And so we used it to try and prosecute the same enzyme class, but now in the plasmodium parasite. So ultimately, I'm going to be showing you some data comparing two of our hit compounds from this class with a negative control. And just to take a whistle-stop tour of some of the data we generated, we found our HIT compounds had nanomolar activity at inhibiting growth of plasmodium falciparum in common laboratory strains, including a number of drug-resistant strains. We showed our compounds were stage unspecific in the blood. They seemed to be equally active on all the blood stages of plasmodium falciparum. They were very fast-acting. All these are very good features uh, for these compounds. Interestingly, since they came from a repurposing point of view, the HITs also have a relatively good index for the parasite versus a human liver cell line, which suggests that ultimately one may be able to build a therapeutic index into this compound series. And importantly, they had comparable activity against clinical and field isolates of resistant parasites. Moving beyond many of these in vitro uh, experiments, ultimately we've explored the activity of these compounds in vivo, particularly in collaboration with GSK Treskantos, using a humanized mouse model of falciparum infection. What we see with our compounds is a significant reduction in parasitemia on treatment with our HIT compounds. Actually, we get a much more positive effect with VIX1294 than our other HIT compound. But this differential is just a feature of the different pharmacokinetics of these two compounds. We get better availability, effectively, in, in blood of VIX1294. Importantly, we see other interesting effects on parasites. So collaborating with Dominic Mazia's group, we've used her in vitro culture system to study the dormant liver stages of some of these parasites, which are particularly relevant in vivax infection. These dormant parasites ultimately lead to recurrent malaria and are currently only treatable by one specific drug. And this drug, unfortunately, is not tolerated by people with a certain deficiency that's common in areas where malaria is endemic. So there's a lot of interest in other therapeutic approaches that can tackle these dormant liver stage parasites. And using Dominic's novel assay system, we were able to show that our compounds appear to accelerate the activation of these dormant parasites, effectively wake them up to a proliferating form that can be killed with a common antimalarial. So potentially, once further validated, that could represent a quite interesting alternative strategy to tackle such dormant parasites, somewhat tackling latency that's been looked at in other diseases. Now, ultimately, I've told you about a lot of exciting parasite effects of our compounds. What I haven't told you much about is are we on target? 
Is the effect we see with our compounds because we're inhibiting the histone lysine methyl transferases, or are there one or more off targets of our compound series? Well, we have limited tools presently to ask this question, but we've seen some evidence that we are on target or at least affect the target. We see dose-dependent changes in histone methylation when we treat with our compounds, as one would expect if you hit this enzyme class. We also have done quite a large array of medicinal chemistry studies around our series, and the structure-activity relationships we see correlate to what one would expect when we inhibit this particular target class. But we really want to strengthen our on-target evidence that we have. And we're taking two primary approaches moving forward. One is trying to recombinantly express stable, soluble, active enzymes that enable thorough biophysical and biochemical assays. We've recently reported our first successful efforts to express plasmodium set 7 and characterize that, showing it to be a histone lysine methyl transferase and further characterizing it. Unfortunately, it would seem BIX1294 does not inhibit this enzyme, so this is not a good start point, but we've got five more essential ones to go, so you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep ticking them off and we'll see where we get to. But the other approach we're taking is effectively developing probes based on our HIT inhibitors to effectively go fishing in plasmodium falciparum lysates and in cells to try and pull out whatever our molecules are bound to and ask that question, do they bind to our targets and how important is that event? Ultimately, I'm not going to focus much on the data we've generated here because Alex, who's somewhere in the audience, is a PhD student in my group who's presenting a poster. So please go and see her poster about this data if you want to know more about these studies. Oops. So in conclusion, what I wanted to present to you is we've aimed to validate the histone lysine methyl transferases so far using a repurposing approach. And I believe we've discovered exciting compounds that have interesting blood stage activity, very interesting liver stage activity, and our work in hypothesis is that at least some of these effects are related to the target that we are trying to address. That said, we're doing a lot more studies to try and further identify and validate that target, and we continue to be interested in the general medicinal chemistry of this compound series to see if one could, irrespective of the target, develop interesting new anti-malarial compounds. With that, I'll finish. I'd like to thank everyone involved in this project. As I said, this was led by myself and Arta Scherf's group, but there's been a huge variety of labs involved in this research, particularly a whole body of data here facilitated by MMV. So I'm very thankful for them also, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matt. Great talk, and we have a few minutes for questions. see the data I've heard you talk about for so long. Um, I'm, I'm interested in terms of that uh, difference in uh, IC UEC50. Um, why do you think the human drug is so much more potent against plasmodium? Do you, I mean, do you think there's an accumulation aspect that, that it's been kind of taken up and you get a concentration effect? Or do you actually think that the plasmodium enzyme is actually, for whatever reason, structurally more of targetable by this particular compound? I don't believe we've got any evidence for an accumulation effect. So I can't discount things like that, but we don't have evidence. I think one has to be careful, of course, of, of looking at the effects in, in, let's say, human cells of a human inhibitor. It depends on the dependency on the human target on the cell type of interest. So actually, many of the human inhibitors that are being clinically prosecuted are being done in cancers that have basically a genetic dependency on that target of interest, which means if you treat them with an inhibitor, you know, it kills them. Whereas many other cell types are actually far less affected by these inhibitors. There's a lot of regulatory processes and packaging, if you like, of these processes, which mean they're not actually that toxic, these inhibitors, to human cells generally. So quite what that means a little bit depends on whether we're on target, what are the off-targets and how important are the off-targets and how do they relate to potency in the parasites? So effectively all I'm saying is that particular human cell line, there's no reason to believe it should be hypersensitive to the human enzyme, which is G9A in this case, inhibition, because many human cells aren't. Why the parasite is much more sensitive is part of the question we're hoping to address now. <laughs> 
Hi, man. Um, so, yeah, really nice data. So I noticed that you were trying to get resistant mutants. Do you think there's a chance that since this is transcriptional <coughs> regulated target, that you'll end up seeing resistance through transcriptional rewiring rather than actual mutation? It's an interesting, it's an interesting idea, and, and all I can really say at this stage is possible, possibly. We have tried unsuccessfully to generate resistant parasites for quite some time. Now, what that may mean is it may mean that we indeed have a few different targets of this series or so polypharmacology, and so it's actually quite difficult for the parasite to develop resistance. That's one option. Um, other than that, it's hard to speculate until we see resistance. Now, there is another group in, at WEHI in Australia who have also been developing the uh, similar chemotype, but not against these targets, against a different one. They have managed to grow resistant parasites. So we're in talks with them to, to once they've identified what the mutation is and what the resistance is, cross-screen against our compounds and see. My guess is it, it may be a, a non-specific resistance mechanism, so kind of an efflux or something, something of that ilk. But again... I need to wait for the data. So, so it would be very interesting. I mean, it's one of the reasons we love to have a resistant um, thing, because it tells us more about our target, but it also tells us more about the mechanisms for a transcriptional target, which I think would be very interesting.